are presenting the book, The Starfish and the Spider. It's the unstoppable power of the leaderless organization. It's written by Ori Brofman and Rod Beckstrom. Um, Ori Brofman has his BA in Peace and Conflict Studies at Berkeley and his MBA at Stanford. He is an entrepreneur in business, government, and nonprofit sectors. Um, he's launched a healthy fast food restaurant and co-founded Courtroom Connect, which is a wireless network company. And the second author, Rod Beckstrom, has his bachelor's and his MBA at Stanford. Um, he is the chairman and council of presidents of the Associated Students of Stanford. He is an author and a high-tech entrepreneur. Um, and he is the CEO and president of ICANN, which coordinates the global internet system of unique identities, and it ensures stable and secure operations. Um, in chapter one of The Starfish and the Spider, um, it talks about decentralization and centralization. Decentralization, there is no clear leader, and it's open, a flexible system with shared power. And in a centralized system, there is command and control and rules. Um, some examples of these orga um, decentralized organizations um, is the Apache Indians. Um, the Spanish army defeated the Aztecs in two years but couldn't defeat the Apaches in 200 years, and this is because they were such a decentralized organization. Um, another example is Geronimo. He never commanded any army. Rather, he himself started fighting, and then other people followed in. And then a more modern example is Napster, and one man started sharing music on the internet, and then just more people started sharing. There are seven principles talked about in the book. The first one is when attacked, a decentralized organization tends to become even more open and decentralized. The second principle is, it's easy to mistake starfish for spiders. The third is, an open system doesn't have central intelligence. The fourth principle states, open systems can easily mutate. The fifth, the decentralized organization sneaks up on you. The sixth principle is, as industries become centralized, overall profits decrease. And the seventh principle, says put people into an open system and they will automatically want to contribute. Okay, chapter three is called A Sea of Starfish. It starts off by defining a decentralized organization. It defines it as an organization in which decision making is not confined to a few top executives but is spread throughout the organization. A few examples are Craigslist, where people who use the site run it. Um, it started off by being Craig's idea, but people's suggestions and ideas keep the site flowing. Another example is the Apache web development. No one person is in charge, and people provide input in their best ideas, and the best ones are used. It's an open source, so anyone can download it for free and make changes to it. The third example is Wikipedia, which is an online encyclopedia developed by, developed by users. Users easily edit the website and add any information that they think is reasonable. My chapter is chapter four, which discusses the five legs used in a decentralized organization. When these legs work together, they help promote a better working organization. The first leg is circles, a group of people defined by a location or physical place. Uh, circles can gain freedom and flexibility nowadays using the internet which is not defined by a certain physical location. Uh, the clo uh, circles can also be defined by their sense of closeness and accountability between each group and member. The next leg is a catalyst. The catalyst creates the reaction within the group. Uh, they help in fusing and combining the people and members within the organization, and they initiate and inspire Leg three is ideology. It's the glue that holds a group together, uh, and it also um, it brings a group together, such as the example stated in AA. Ideology is the people who come together to help one another. Leg four is pre-existing pre network, which is created from an original network, such as one business being bought out by another business. And leg five is champion. A champion is a leader who is charismatic and inspiring. Um, he's relentless and promotes new ideas. He is the person who is always outgoing and making sure everything works right within the organization. Chapter 4, The Hidden Powers of the Catalyst. 
Um, this talks about um, what a catalyst is, and they are somebody who motivates others through their speak or um, their enthusiasm, and they get them to do a better job. Um, the book used a great example of Jimmy Wales, and he's the founder of Wikipedia, and um, he kind of allows people to do, he tells them what he wants, kind of, but then steps back and lets it happen. Um, this is called the hands-off approach. Um, this is one of the tools that a catalyst might use. Another one is being genuinely interested in everybody. Um, that way they feel like they're a part of the company and um, just really interested in doing a really good job. Um, another tool is mapping. Um, they create a map of the whole organization and how everybody fits into the organization and who needs to know who and that way they can do a great job. Um, they're also really willing to help. Um, that's what kind of drives them. They are there when you need them, but when they're not, when they're not needed, you, they can't be found. Um, this person has a passion for what they do, um, a passion for um, empowering others and um, helping others to connect with each other. Um, they don't push people to do um, better. They kind of um, meet them where they're at and listen very well and um, that pushes people to do better because they feel like somebody cares about them. Um, they also make an emotional connection and that kind of ties in with meeting people where they're at. Um, a catalyst must also trust other people to do their work or else they're going to micromanage um, and then they wouldn't be a catalyst. Um, they also um, use inspiration. Um, without inspiration, employees would not follow what the catalyst um, wants them to do. Um, so the last part of the chapter was the catalyst versus the CEO. And um, this is saying that like a CEO is kind of sought as somebody who's powerful in the face of the company, whereas the catalyst is more behind the scenes and um, just kind of does what needs to be done, but doesn't really want the recognition for it. Chapter six is called Taking on Decentralization. Uh, the first strategy of decentralization is um, changing ideology. The only part of decentralized organization that you can realistically go after is the ideology. Micro lending in Kenya, Jamie Burrow, changes the ideology from life is hopeless, so, might, so I might as well join a terrorist cell so there is hope I can make my life better. The second strategy is centralize them, or the cow approach. What broke the Apache society is the Americans gave them cattle. Their power shifted from symbolic to material. Now they could reward and punish the tribe members by giving and withholding this resource. The moment you introduce property rights to the equation, everything changes. The starfish organization turns into a spider. If you really want to centralize an organization, hand property rights to the catalyst and tell him to distribute, distribute resources as he sees fit. The catalyst turns into a CEO and circles become competitive. The third strategy is simple. Decentralize yourself. If you can't beat them, join them. The best opponent for a starfish organization is often another starfish. Chapter 7 is about the combo special, the hybrid organization. eBay represents the combo special. It's neither a pure starfish nor a pure spider, but what we call a hybrid organization. Combines the, best, combines the best of both worlds. The bottom up approach of decentralization and the structure, control, and resulting profit potential of centralization. eBay is a centralized company that decentralized the customer experience. Oprah's book club, unintentionally, she catalyzed a network of readers and created a decentralized community with unexpected power. While the production company remained centralized, she had added a decentralized element to her show. Google's architect architecture is fundamentally based on user input. Retrieve sites that other people have found useful. Instead of competing with decentralized market on entrants, IBM supported them. It deployed 600 engineers whose sole job has to contribute to Lingux, and it actively supported the development of Apache and Firefox. Like IBM, Sun has opted to forego revenues from software sales in favor of making money on auxiliary services and hardware. The open source movement has thrown the industry into chaos. 
Google, Sun, and IBM have put their customers to work, while Oprah and eBay have given them a voice. The second type of hybrid organization is a centralized company that decentralizes internal parts of the business. These companies have a CEO and some hierarchy, but they also have starfish-like DNA. DFJ, a venture capitalist company, rather than centralizing it in one or two offices, DFJ has 19 U.S. offices and 23 abroad. The idea is to cast a wide net and leverage each partner's individual network in a given region. Dave Cooper Ryder, professor at Case Western Business School, developed a process called Appreciative Inquiry, which is based on people asking each other meaningful questions. You realize it is a way of decentralizing an organization. They bring in people from all levels of the company, and he pairs them up, and each person interviews his or her partner. After a while, people begin to see each other as individuals instead of a boss or a subordinate. After interviewing each other, par participants from circles where they are encouraged to dream and brainstorm. Every idea is given credit in. The combo special requires a constant balancing act, and they must seek and pursue the elusive sweet spot. Okay. Okay. Concept in Chapter 8 of Starfish and the Spider is that a hybrid organization is the best approach. The reason for this is that a mix of a starfish and a spider organization gives you the benefits of both. A spider organization gives you more control. A starfish organization gives you more freedom to express your ideas. Um, different companies need to be more of a spider or a starfish organization. Um, a company based on reliability, security, um, things of that nature needs to be a spider because they need to be reliable, they need to be controlled. Um, it's important that they're organized. And a company based on information, such as the music industry or something of that nature, needs to be a starfish because they need more freedom to express their ideas. Concept in Chapter 9 of Starfish and the Spider is it's basically rules that a CEO wants to follow if they want to survive in the new business world. Um, the first major part, major set of rules, is the small um, organization with many users is the most powerful. The reason for this is even if you lose a couple users or a small part of the organization, it just grows back stronger. Um, and it's a lot harder to attack. So it makes it more you know, powerful, harder to break down. Um, the second major set of rules is a organization, uh, a starfish organization, is more likely to generate uh, good ideas or crazy ideas or just more information. Because when you have freedom in the organization, um, People are more open to expressing themselves, and that can generate a lot more information quicker. Um, the last major set of rules is that a CEO should be more like a catalyst. They need to flatten the organization, make it more like a starfish organization. Uh, the reason for this is it gives you the benefits of the starfish organization, but it keeps the control of a spider organization. So basically, um, if you want to survive in the business world, you need to be a hybrid organization.